you get freedom from birth and death in this material world. So in any case, we have a Father's Day message today. Um, those who are interested in this subject matter are welcome to correspond with us. Uh, we put these on iTunes. We have them for download on our website. So aside from the handful of people that are here, there are people all over the world that, believe it or not, do listen to these talks and give us feedback. And you're welcome uh, to correspond with us at utahchristians at gmail.com. Or you can uh, take our membership class and uh, get back to us also. The membership class is available on the website at www.utahchristianist.org. Everything is based on the teachings of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Here's some cool Father's Day stuff. Here's some inf interesting information about Father's Day. Uh, on Mother's Day, the, the, the most phone calls of any other day of the year are made. So more phone calls are made on Mother's Day than any other day of the year. On Father's Day, there are not more overall phone calls made, but there are more collect phone calls made than any other day of the year. <laughs> and uh, most kids, most young kids, you know, they don't really see that much difference between Father's Day and Mother's Day. The only difference is that on Father's Day, the present can be cheaper, less expensive. Now we want to actually specifically talk about seeing God as a loving Father. Many, many people see God as a, uh, an intimidating, imperial, monarchical, distant, way out there, untouchable entity. Uh, and they feel like they can only relate to him in a very, very formal way, standing before him in awe and reverence and majesty, with the, trying to keep the tremble, tremors out of their body and their knees from knocking together. Uh, there's a deep uh, respect for that imperial lord and a reverential fear um, in our culture, Krishna is the original personality of Godhead, the, the youthful, playful, mischievous, loving Krishna. But uh, for the purposes of creating and maintaining and annihilating the universe, he expands into this formal Old Testamentish sort of imperial form of Vishnu. And if you look at that picture over there, you'll see Krishna in the center, very, very approachable, amiable, lo loving. Um, and he, in fact, reserves himself for intimate relationships with his devotees. Relationships are what we're put here for. That's what we'll be judged on at the end of the life. Not how much money you have in the bank or how many bowling trophies you earned or how many times your name is in the newspaper. You'll be judged in two areas, and they both have to do with relationships. Did you, did you enrich, did you have a meaningful vertical relationship with God, and did you enhance your horizontal relationship with other living beings? That's why, why and how God created us. And we're created in the image of God. So God himself, the source from which we come and of which we're a reflection, is all about relationships. That's all he's, In fact, he's so much about relationships that when it comes to creating and maintaining and all the managerial concerns with unlimited spiritual ministry, he doesn't have anything to do with that. He expands himself like one candle can light another candle, and then he becomes Vishnu. And he reserves himself exclusively for loving relationships between him and his eternally liberated uh, spirit souls. So that Vishnu can be very intimidating, that Vishnu aspect of God. Uh, uh, some people even think that Vishnu is out to get them, to punish them for sins or to, you know, watching over them, keeping score and ready to smack them when they do something wrong up there uh, in the spiritual world with a baseball bat, looking down from heaven, just waiting for you to make a mistake, waiting for you to mess up. They see God as a, an enforcer, you see, as a, as a heavy dude, as harsh, mean, and is putting pressure on them that they can never, ever live up to. But what we want to emphasize on this day is to see God as a loving Father, not as an enforcer. Uh, to see him as a loving father, one who is for you, who helps you overcome and gives you grace when you make a mistake, who cheers you on as you pursue your dreams, someone who believes the best in you. Not a God who is far out, who is out to get you, who is just pointing out what you're doing wrong. A God who is a loving father and as such is a source of constant strength and encouragement, who's there to lift you when you fall, to pick you up when you're down, push you forward, encourage you to go the extra mile uh, when you feel like giving up. He's the friend who sticks closer than a brother. 
Prabhupada says this about God as a loving father. Krishna is the supreme living entity. And since Krishna is the source of our generation or the supreme father, no one can be a better friend or well-wisher than Krishna. Now, we have to be very careful because most of us project whatever it was we experienced from our earthly father, we tend to project that on our heavenly father. And if our earthly father was mean or harsh or judgmental or impossible to please, if he was not there when you needed him, you have to be careful to separate that earthly experience from the nature and character of your heavenly father. It's like someone who's been getting counterfeit money all their life and at a certain point they cease to believe that there's any real money out there at all. Just the opposite. In fact, the counterfeit money is evidence that somewhere or other there's real money. So if you had a harsh, mean, judgmental, distant father, uh, don't let that taint your image of the Heavenly Father of God. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever had the experience of going down to the pound and rescuing a dog. And then maybe if you were a man, every time you tried to go close to that dog or pet it, it would put its tail between its legs and maybe run to your wife or run to the kids. And you'd think, well, what did I do wrong? And then you looked a little bit further, you went back to the pound, you asked about the history of this particular dog, and it turns out that that dog was abused by a harsh, mean, vicious, cruel former owner who was a man. And so the dog sees all men as harsh, vicious, cruel, and, uh, and insensitive. So it may take you many, 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 many weeks and months of giving, lavishing that dog with love and tenderness before those memories become distant memories. And he ceases to paint all men with the same brush as his former owner. So similarly, if you've had a material father who was less than ideal, don't uh, mix that up with the idea of the heavenly father. It's easy to have the same image of your heavenly father as it is of your earthly father. A God who's going to condemn you, just like your earthly father did, who's going to berate you, just like your earthly father did when you do wrong, uh, whose standards you're never going to ever measure up like your earthly father. Please don't mix up that image with the image of our heavenly father. On the other hand, if you didn't have a bad father, if you had a good father, then you can project that I had a good father, I had a loving father, I had a kind father, I had a father who cherished me, for whom I was the most important thing in his life, who looked out for me, who liked to brag on me. If you, if you experience all those things in your earthly father, then just imagine how much better it's going to be when you meet up again with your heavenly father. He will be loving, he will be kind, he will be good, he will think that all of his kids are the greatest kids in the world and he would do anything for them. So this brings us to our video, the experiences that we've had with um, earthly fathers. Hopefully they've been positive ones. If we're going to get any audio out of this. Okay. There we go.
and finally today we honor our fathers who have passed away. May their good deeds live on through you, and may their careless deeds be corrected in your lifetime. Today is a special day. So for all the fathers we mentioned, and even those who didn't, be honored, be blessed, and be joyful. We believe that you have what it takes to change the world, and you're doing it one relationship at a time. This uh, accompanying this uh, video is the story of a pastor whose son was ill and uh, uh, entered into a hospital after which a battery and battery of tests was done on the son. And the doctors came up with the test results that the son was terminally ill and in fact would not live for more than a few more days. And the pastor was a very humble pastor agonized over how he was going to break this news to his very, very young four or five year old son. So he went into the room where his son was uh, lying down. He said a prayer with him. He put his hand over the heated brow of the boy. And he told the son, he said, the doctors who have examined you have determined that you're ill and they cannot promise you more than just a few more days to live. And at that point, the pastor asked his little son, he asked him, are you afraid to meet your heavenly father? And the little boy said, no, daddy, if he's just like you. I didn't always see eye to eye with my father. My father wasn't ideal. Um, But there were two instances in my experience with him that I'll never forget and which actually made up for many, many omissions. One time, he, after he retired, he worked in Pittsburgh for uh, Westinghouse Air Brake, and he retired and he did real estate. And uh, I was home uh, from being a devotee for a couple of days for one reason or another, and he was out at the real estate office. And we, we didn't see eye to eye, and he, he clearly let me know that he disapproved of my being a Hare Krishna, and he had a way of being aloof and indifferent when I didn't do the things that he wanted me to do, which was most of the time. But the phone rang one time in the house, when he was away at the office and I happened to be walking and I picked up the phone and here and it was dad and he said, Chris, I just want you to know I love you. And he was a very emotional person as, as I am. And probably he he did and he's a, a career uh, in the army, he was a lieutenant colonel in the reserves and he was in World War Two and all that. So probably he never he never felt that he could say this to me face to face or show his emotions without actually going over the top. And so he had he telephoned me and he said, I want you to know I loved you. And then I think, I, I think he must have taken that moment because he was alone in the office. And then I think someone must have walked into the office because he was starting to cry. And I, as soon as I started to say, the phone went down. <laughs> Put the phone down. <laughs> and, uh, and then when he was uh, passing away, I think this is in um, 1992, I believe. Uh, he had Parkinson's disease and he was really only going to live for another few hours. And uh, I was in California. And so my mother passed the phone over to dad and he said, Chris, I love you. And so those were, you know, among the last words that he ever spoke. And so I had that affirmation anyway, that even though he didn't have the tools, you see, to necessarily show that on a day-to-day basis, um, you know, it, uh, it, it helped me to realize that uh, a father will always love his son. Uh, he may put pressure in various ways to get his son to conform to certain uh, behavioral patterns, but that's that's uh, his way of trying to guide the son and to do the best for it, best for the son. Unfortunately, we all have to run our own race, and so that doesn't always leave the best impression. But a loving father wants the best for his children, and for a loving father, there's no aloofness, there's no indifference, there's no psychological subtle pressure. A loving father is vitally interested in all the details of their son or their daughter's life. And they want to make sure that you're well taken care of. Now we know many, many rich men, heads of states, prime ministers, Zions, business companies, and they may be too busy to take calls sometimes from other CEOs or from other heads of states, but there's one category of of persons that they'll always take a call from. They'll always take a call from their children. 
They'll walk out of parliament. They'll walk out of an important meeting. They'll walk out of a business deal when a contract's about to be signed. When their eight or nine or ten year old son or daughter is going to call. The children always have a hotline to see to their loving parent. And we always have a hotline to God. Whenever we want to speak to Him or share with Him or lay our problems towards Him, He's only too delighted to hear from us. He's the Lord of the universe and when our problems get uh, overburdensome and we feel that we can't handle them, all we have to do is give them to Him. They're nothing for Him. He's well qualified. He who runs the universe is to handle your problem. It may be too much for you, but it's a piece of cake for Him. And He's actually delighted when we pick up the phone and in a manner of speaking, we call and we say, Lord, I've got a problem. I want to talk to you. We're not going to get a recording. We won't be transferred to a call center overseas. We'll actually reach our loving, caring Father. I once saw a cynical cartoon, a Garfield cartoon. He was calling a suicide hotline. And apparently, they've even farmed those out now to overseas. And this was a suicide hotline, apparently in the Middle East. So Garfield picked up the phone. He got someone with an accent. He said, I'm feeling suicidal lately. And the person on the other end of the line said, can you drive a truck? So God will always lend us a sympathetic ear. He'll not manipulate us according to his mold. Uh, He will listen to what it is that we're concerned about. He'll assume our problems and, uh, and help us out. As God's child will always have access, he'll stop whatever it is he's doing. And when he sees your name come across the caller ID, he'll be delighted. He longs to hear from us more than we actually long to speak to him. Although he's younger than me, I had some of this experience with Dr. Dinesh Patel. He's a few years younger than me. But he is a very, very well-to-do person. And I think because of this quality of being non-judgmental and being interested in details, he's called the Michelangelo of venture capital in the western states. And in many ways, he guides the economy of Utah. Uh, dispensing hundreds of millions of dollars from the legislature for seed uh, venture money and seed capital for Utah startup companies. Um, so when we were building this temple, it was an impossible ambition to build a temple of this category in an area that's 90% Mormon. Nothing against Mormons, but they're very committed and very involved in their own religion in terms of time and wealth. And so you really can't expect much Uh, other than volunteer support, of which we got a lot, and a a lot of sympathy, a lot of uh, good wishes. But it was basically an impossible venture. But from the very beginning, Dr. Patel supported it. He thought it was a great idea. He loves loves the impossible. He loves that which is to try to make that which is impossible possible. So after our Sunday feast, and we were down in the log house in those days, uh, and this was just a dream. In fact, uh, on the Jagannath Rathyatra, uh, which is, again, as I mentioned, going to happen two weeks from today. We used to take those Jagannath deities on a palaquin from the log house, and we used to come up here with chanting and with kirtan, and we'd sort of stop at the, where the northwest corner of the temple was going to be, and it was just bushes and llama poop, and we would say, Lord Jagannath, you know, we're going to have a magnificent temple here someday, and year after year, we would bring Lord Jagannath back to this same old bush, and probably not the same old llama poop, you know, that's fresh supply all the time and we would promise him that there would be a big temple here year after year and after a while we even started doubting whether it would actually happen and then finally we got a little momentum and I said Lord Jagannath one year I said I promise you there will be a what do they call that a, what do they call that the foundation I said next year when we bring you here there will be a foundation the temple construction will have started well the following year we came and there was no foundation and I said Lord Jagannath I lied I'm very sorry but next year And then the next year there was a foundation, and then the next year there were walls, and then the third year this temple opened up. But the interesting thing was, Dr. Patel would call me every night, every Sunday night about 9 o'clock. The cell phone would ring, and he would call me and say, what happened this week? I was having to come up with $30,000 or $40,000 a month, a a week, a month, $30,000 or $40,000 a month, in order that the construction not stall. And he would call me up and say, how did it go? What happened? And at first I was just amazed that this man who consorts with governors and senators, he's been an intimate friend of three previous governors of Utah, the senators, 
Uh, there isn't a business leader in Utah and America that doesn't know him. This man calls me up on Sunday night at 9 o'clock and gets all the details. Every bit of minutia having to do with the temple. And so, as, as it is said, sometimes we can, un, we can estimate the distance of the moon by looking through a nearby branch to get some idea of another dimension, a depth of dimension. So in my relations with Dr. Patel and various members of the Indian community, uh, I have to come to get some inkling of what our loving Father is, uh, what his nature and personality is. And one quality is that you can speak frankly to him. You don't have to pretend to be something that you aren't. He loves you as you are, in your brokenness, uh, in the way that you are. He wants to hear whatever it is that you have to say. Just like our little child. What the child says to Jonathan doesn't have to necessarily make, make sense. She doesn't have to have been right. She doesn't have to come with him with a litany of all the A's that she got on tests. Uh, she doesn't have to have always been virtuous with her friends. She doesn't always have to have done the right thing. That's not what's important to Jonathan. But what's important is that she comes to him and she confides and that she shares in her broken infantile language. So it's not important that we be great poets, that we necessarily be perfect in our lives, but it's important that we speak frankly without feeling judged. And that, that's the characteristic of the Lord. Well, someone says, true, you're a priest. You live in the temple. You wear the tilak, the clothes. Why don't you say a good word to Krishna for me? You're more qualified than me. Well, I am not closer to God. I am not any more a child of God than you are. In India, India is hamstrung to some degree by the Brahmin class. People believe that they can only go to God through the Brahmins. Even some of the Brahmins smoke and drink and have bad habits. People have this conditioning, uh, this kind of brainwashed condition to think that the Brahmins, no matter what their personal habits or consciousness, are a conduit to God. But the Brahmins are no more sons of God than you and I are. God will listen to you. He wants to talk to you. Uh, you have direct access to Him. You don't have to go through a third party. One thing that is emphasized in Krishna's treatise, the Bhagavad Gita, is to hear about the Lord from the lips of a pure devotee. To hear about the Lord from a pure devotee. To hear about the beloved from the lover. If you're ever a teenager and you went away to camp and you had a roommate in the tent and the roommate was telling you about this great guy she, she knew or she was dating or about this great girl she knew was dating and you're listening to them go on and on and on about the qualities of this girl, the qualities of this guy, you actually fall in love. I've had that experience myself. I never met the girl, but he talks about her in such glowing terms. Wow, what a great girl. You almost fall in love yourself. And that wouldn't happen if you were talking to someone who's just uh, indifferent. So hear about the Lord from someone who is a devotee, a pure devotee of the Lord. And you can access the Lord directly. Our principal technique for doing this is the chanting of the names of the Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Krishna is a name for God, which means all attractive. Rama is another name for God, which means Rama, which means highest pleasure absolute. And Hare is a way of addressing the Lord. These are not different gods, they're just different names for the same God, and being absolute, the Lord and His name are non-different. So when you say any bona fide name of the Lord, you're directly accessing the Lord. It is said that one who is chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, has the Lord directly dancing on the tip of their tongue. So we all, as devotees of the Lord, take a certain portion of the day, ideally in the early morning hours, and we hang out with the Lord. We associate with the Lord. After getting up in the morning and the mind is like a clean slate, we impress upon the mind that we are created uh, by God. We are endowed with certain talents and abilities, and He has a purpose for our life. He's a loving Father. He, he's interested in every detail of our life and he has a wonderful, wonderful plan of us. And some of us miss this because we're just in too much awe of God. Uh, we're just in too much reverence. You know, we think of him as the awesome creator of the universes and consorting with, uh, with uh, celestials and divinities and all like that. And we think, you know, well, why would he want to be interested in me? But he is because he created you. 
You are his handiwork. You are his masterpiece. And that awesome Lord of the universe looks at you and he himself is in awe. My son uh, William is awesome. My daughter Elizabeth is amazing. My son Sean is something else. Let me tell you about Elizabeth. Let me tell you about Sean. Let me tell you about the talents and abilities that are inbuilt within them. Let me tell you about the wonderful plan that I have for them. And that loving Father longs to hear from us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As soon as we invoke the name of the Lord, it becomes personal. Lord, God, these are not personal names. They're just titles. Krishna, Allah, Govinda, Vishnu, Gopala. These are personal names of the Lord. This is, these are given to us by the Lord so that we can access Him in a personal way. What is your name, may I ask? Bethany. Bethany, I'm true. So of those who are coming for the first time, I have a little bit more of a personal relationship with Bethany than I do with you by virtue of knowing her name. In fact, the cowboys used to say, what's your handle, partner? And that was, a, that was a handle. Now I've got a handle. I've got something a little bit more going with Bethany than I do with you and vice versa because of the name. So until we recognize that God is a person and use this wonderful benediction of his holy names to access him, the relationship will not actually fructify. and He'll be something distant or otherworldly or indifferent. But saying the name of the Lord brings him close. It helps us realize that he listens to us and he wants to guide us through life. It is said that Krishna gets tired of the hosannas and hallelujahs. He gets tired of people approaching him in awe and reverence with their knees knocking. The chastising words of Radharani, this is Radharani to Krishna's left and our right. He, he enjoys once in a while when some of his devotees chastise him. Uh, it's boring and monotonous and repetitive to have people bowing down before him in awe and reverence. He picks some of his more intimate devotees in order to have, gives them parity and sometimes even superiority over him so that instead of always chastising others, he enjoys it when his pure devotees chastise him. There are instances of great so-called uh, opponents of the Lord throughout history. There's Ravana who came up against Ram. There's Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyakshu who came and opposed Vishnu. There's uh, Kamsa who opposed Krishna during his pastimes. And these are all devotees of the Lord, handpicked from the spiritual world to descend along with him and act the role of his enemies on earth. I'm sure all of you, boys at least, have had the experience with a gang of friends in your youth. Uh, to make things a little more interesting, you would divide up. You guys be the robbers and we'll be the cops. You be the cowboys, you be the Indians. You be the Russians and you be the Americans or whatever it is. You know? uh, and we were, you were all friends, but it just made things a little bit more interesting and suspenseful and dramatic to divide up and play different roles. So the Lord, instead of always punishing and controlling and being worshipped and on reverence, sometimes He likes to lose a good fight. Sometimes He likes to uh, He likes to be bested in uh, combat, but only from those who are loving devotees. This is a picture here. Bhisma is standing on the chariot, and before Krishna is rushed to him with the wheel, Bhisma was putting arrows. He was shooting arrows into Krishna. Bhisma was a great devotee, but it so happened during the Kurukshetra war, he was obliged to fight opposite Krishna. And being thus obliged, he was shooting arrows at God. And Krishna enjoyed the impact of the arrows on his breast. And he felt them as if someone was throwing flowers at him in love and devotion, or the love bites of a lover. If you see God as a loving father, you'll not have self-esteem problems. You'll go through life strong, confident. The father loves to brag on the son. He loves to find people to show you off to. He looks for people to introduce you to. Now, this is the same father that controls the universe, and yet he's concerned about the details of your life. He'll take your call. You're not an orphan. He's proud of you. He tells people of your talents, how smart and great you are. 
to the point that you actually can become even embarrassed. So don't you dare drag through life. Don't you listen to the negative things that people say about you. And don't let your mistakes fill you with inadequacy. You have been fearfully and wonderfully made. When God looks at you, He stands in amazement and He calls you His masterpiece. Have you seen, we have the instance of Harishchandra who was sorely tested. The Lord was saying, have you seen my servant Harishchandra? There is none like him in all of the world. Many people have never seen or they cannot even imagine God as being proud of them. They haven't seen Him as a loving Father, just as the King of Kings. But when you think of God as a loving Father, that's guaranteed to bring a smile to your face. And it's not that He has so many children that He doesn't know you, that He doesn't know your name, that He can't keep track of you. Every single one of you is a favorite child of the Lord. Every parent, just like his kids have come in and they're making a little bit of a disturbance there. But he, he, it's, he doesn't, it's nothing wrong. They haven't done anything wrong. It's just cute. He loves them. He sees them differently than other children. He cuts them slack and he gives them grace. I'm sure you've had the instance where a friend or an acquaintance has cut, brought up a baby and they've showed you the, the baby. And I, I say this respectfully, but the baby may not be that good looking. It, it actually may have all dried up skin. You know, uh, it may be at that stage when the head is disproportionate. It may have drool coming out of its mouth. But they're saying, look at my son. Look at my daughter. Have you ever seen a more beautiful baby than that? And you're saying, no, I never have. Like that, you know. Uh, but every parent sees their child, their offspring, as, as differently because he created them. They think that theirs is the most beautiful baby ever born. Well, you're saying, Cheru, you know, God could not see me that way. I've made mistakes. I've lived a rough life. I've got some bad habits. That's okay. You know, if you're a parent, you know your children are not perfect. But nothing they have ever done has changed the way that you feel about them. You're proud of them just the way they are. You may not be proud or you may not prove all of their actions, but you're proud of them and the feelings that you have will never change no matter what they do. You will always be willing to cut slack and show mercy up there for them. You will take up for them. You will never condemn them. You will forgive them and help them to do better the next time. Prabhupada says here in the Srimad Bhagavatam, The devotees of the Lord are very dear to the Lord. Although the beloved child may accidentally commit an abominable activity, the loving father forgives the child, taking into consideration the actual good intentions of the child. Now, especially when we're giving this subject matter, I've got to just smile and go along with the flow, right? <laughs> I'm not sure how much your attention is still focused on the talk, but considering the subject matter of the talk, we're just going to go with it and smile and they're so cute. <laughs> Others may not be so kind. Others who see you will not necessarily be so kind. Co-workers, fellow students may be judgmental. They make you feel guilty for something that you've done. Harsh and never let you forget a mistake that you've made. But your father will always see you differently. He'll see you more mercifully, forgiving. There's a story of the famous preacher, Charles Stanley. Great, great preacher. And he had a son named Andy Stanley, who is now a fantastic communicator at North Point Church in Atlanta, Georgia. But when Andy was growing up, he used to start out in his father's services with some of his friends, but they would sneak out during the services and they would go to a donut shop. But what they would do is they would turn on the TV in the donut shop where his father's sermons were televised so that if he happened to be asked about the subject matter of the sermon later on, he could pretend he was there and say something about what, what happened. So one of the staff members one day actually happened to wander into the donut shop while the services were going on over the street. Later on, they came to Dr. Stanley and said, I saw your son in a donut shop. That's not a very good example for the son of a famous preacher like you. I think you should dress him down. I think you should rake him over the coals. I think you should set him right. I think, you know, you should put him in his place. And Dr. Stanley said back to this critic, he said, do me a favor. You raise your child, and I'll raise my child. 
Rather than chewing him out and reading the riot rack, he cut him slack. Now the fact that God loves us and sees us differently is not an excuse to live sloppily, to not have integrity, but we all make mistakes. Many of us have been living guilty for something we've done five or ten years ago. We feel beaten down. We listen to voices reminding us of what we've gone wrong. God doesn't neglect. He sees the wrong, but He's not going to condemn you for it. He's going to give you mercy because you are His child. We need to do three things. We need to ask for forgiveness. We need to receive that forgiveness. And we need to move forward with our life and let it go. What it is that you're doing. You may have done something that you've asked forgiveness for a thousand times. And you don't feel forgiven. And you feel you have to pay back God or some other uh, uh, atone for the bad things that you've done. Try to show that you're sorry. But hey, the first time you asked for forgiveness, it was given. It was given the first time that you asked for it. Uh, So let it go and pass ahead in your life. Having made a mistake doesn't change any of our names. If you got up in the morning as a warden and you made a mistake during the day, you didn't go to bed as a Smith or a Jones. You're still a warden. So having made mistakes does not change the fact that God is your father and you're still related to him and you're still in his family. What he wants to see is he doesn't look for perfection. He doesn't look for perfection. He looks to see if you're still in the game. If you've fallen down and you're lying there in self-pity or if you've fallen down and you've gotten up and you've continued your walk towards the light. Sometimes religionists themselves will act in such a way as to beat us down and advise us to sit on the sidelines. You've done wrong. You can never rectify it. You can never be right in the the eyes of God. So you might as well just give up and get out of the way. Sit on the sidelines. You're a loser. You've blown it. Exactly. But God knows what you've done. You can be forgiven. There's a story of a man who told his son, never climb on this oak tree. There was a big oak tree in the backyard. He said, never climb on the oak tree. It's very, very dangerous. So one day on a Sunday morning, he hears his son, help, dad, help, dad, help, dad. And he's hanging by his fingernails from a high branch in the oak tree. So the father's not going to like inquire, what are you doing at the oak tree? He's not going to ask the mother, did he do his chores this morning? Did he make his bed? Uh, uh, He's not going to ask any of those things. He's not going to nitpick. He's not going to concentrate on the mistakes or what the kid did wrong. Even though he told the child not to climb on the oak tree, even though the child willfully disobeyed the orders of the father and willfully broke broke his command and got himself into trouble, the father doesn't say, okay, you know, you're on your own. I told you what to do. You disobeyed me. You're on your own. The father... Uh, doesn't even consider any of those. He runs to help the child as soon as the child helps. So you may have broken command. You may have known what the right thing was to do and you may have intentionally and willfully uh, omitted doing the right thing. You may have committed a wrongdoing. But if you, if you communicate with him, if you ask for his help, he will be right there to help you out. He's not going to leave you Hanging. He's not just your creator. He's not just an enforcer. He's not just a guy up there with a baseball bat. He's also your father. And he'll help you without finding fault. So let us not again mix up the experience that we might have had with a less than ideal material father who might have been harsh and judgmental. Uh, uh, If we've had a good father, an ideal father, and a loving father, then it becomes more easy to call upon our Heavenly Father. Uh, Sometimes He'll bring correction. Of course, He wants us to correct our ways and not willfully be disobedient. But He doesn't harp on it. He doesn't berate it. He doesn't nag on us. Those are the voices of our accusers trying to keep us moving forward and becoming all that we should become. If you didn't have a good father growing up, don't let that taint your image. Heavenly Father is loving, forgiving. He's incredibly proud of you. He loves showing you off. He thinks you're amazing. You don't have to go through anyone else. You can directly chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama, Hare Hare. 
The Father will always take your call. If you begin to see Him as a Father, you won't go through life feeling guilty, condemned, like you never measure up. You'll be strong, you'll be confident, secure. You'll be everything that He has created you to be, and you will live that life of victory that He has in store for you. Can you say it? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare. You get freedom from birth and death in this material.